computer. Okay, now we're recording, and I uh, would like to welcome everyone to the July 2020 HAL 5 webinar. I'm David Newsom, the president of HAL 5, and I believe everyone can see, can see my screen here. Uh, tonight's speaker is Jim Plasco from the, Chica from the Chicago Society Core Space Studies, and his uh, talk will be entitled "The Planet uh, that will be Planet Planet Earth." Planet Earth as Art, and um, just to give a two quick, two quick, quick announcements. Uh, next month on next month uh, next month uh, next month August thirteenth at seven p.m. we'll be having a, a, a Craig, 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 Craig Allison from HAL Five who will discuss his research. Uh, who will discuss his research on discuss his re re research research his research on space habitats and in september on september 15th at 6 p.m central uh, there will be a joint panel discussion with hal 5 the society for technical communications and dr ryan dr ryan weber i i uh, it'll be uh, uh and and Dr. Ryan and and Dr. Ryan Ryan Weber, uh, who, who will discuss a joint panel discussion on uh, on uh, on books or upon a who will have a joint panel a joint panel discussion about space books, uh, and so we'll be sending out some uh, uh, more de details about those two talks in the next few weeks. And uh, let me see here where. I'm going to go ahead and yes, see here. I'm going to go ahead and um, I don't know if I shared my screen. Hold on, let's see here. Uh, did everyone see that? By the way, I wasn't sure if I shared my screen. Were, 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 were you? Could you see that? Yes. Okay. So anyway, the total of the two talks, August thirteenth and September fifteenth. And I'll be uh, posting that stuff online pr pretty soon as well. And then I'm, I believe uh, I'm going to turn off, uh, turn the floor to you now, Tim. So uh, let me go ahead and mute myself, and you can start presenting now. But you Great. should be able to show your screen. All right. Thank you, David. Thank you. Well, I tell you, I'd, too bad we can't be doing this in person. Uh, I have spoken to the Hal Five uh, group before. It was. Uh, several years ago, uh, down at the, I believe it was the uh, Von Braun Planetarium. So it was a wonderful experience. It was great to see folks like, you know, Ronnie and Greg face to face after so many years. So uh, this will be a little bit of a different experience this time around. Uh, the title of my talk, Planet Earth is Art, the View from Space. And the point I want to make this evening is that I would ask each of you to consider our planet itself as a work of art. And for whatever reason, my screen wasn't advancing. So this is just a quick uh, overview of some of my background that's relevant uh, to my presentation tonight. Uh, I'm speaking primarily as a digital artist, but also as uh, a National Space Society Space Ambassador and as president of the Chicago Society for Space Studies. So uh, I also do astronomical art, and Jupiter is a favorite of mine because I just find it so abstract in appearance because of the nature of the fluid dynamics that's driving uh, its atmosphere and the chemistry that's going on. And the thing about uh, space artists is they try to be as photo real as possible to as accurately as possible portray the thing it is that they're visualizing. So, uh, for an astronomical artist, you want to be as much like a camera as possible, uh, which is the opposite of abstract art. Um, 
So here I've got figurative art, but if you look at it at a different level, it could be considered abstract art. So what I'd like everyone to do is to put on your art critics hat this evening and uh, being mindful of the elements of art, the line, color, shapes, the forms you may see, the values, the use of space, the texture of each of these images. Uh, how does it strike you if you're looking at, at the photo as if it's a painting on a canvas? Do you find it aesthetically pleasing? If the answer is yes, I argue that it's worthy of being called art. And to give you a couple of examples of abstract art, here's a rather famous work by Kandinsky. And I'd ask you to note his use of line, shape, space, uh, the relationships between shapes, spaces, his use of color, how bright or dark parts uh, of the painting are or of the painting is overall. These are all the elements of art. And here's a, another quite famous work of abstract art by Jackson Pollock. Uh, uh, I leave it to you to decide whether or not it qualifies as art or not. Uh, it may not be your cup of tea. But you know, if you look at it, it looks like there's a lot of randomness uh, and chance in this painting. And for me, randomness is uh, an element of nature and nature's laws. So you could say in one sense that this is a natural painting. Now, if you just look at this, and if I were to cover up the subtitle at the bottom, you might think that this is a work of abstract art, but it's not. It's actually pretty strictly representational. It's a digital painting I did of Chinley Creek, uh, basing it on an aerial photograph. It looks abstract to us because it's un an unusual perspective. It's an overhead perspective. Um, and it's uh, a creek that's running through a desert area. So I've intensified the colors a little bit. So I say this is an unusual perspective, but this is becoming something that is less and less true as we absorb more and more satellite imagery and as more and more people use things like uh, Google Earth or Zoom Earth or NASA WorldWind or any one of another uh, family of applications that allow us to view the Earth from on high. And you know, I find this statement by Plato that was made over 2,300 years ago to be really prophetic. Uh, where he's saying that we have to rise above the earth and above the atmosphere to really understand our home planet. Uh, so I can only speculate at what the people who were around to hear him say that at the time were thinking, but it is certainly proven now, 2,000 years later, to be a very true statement. And it wasn't until 1946 that we actually got our first glimpse of the Earth from space. So this is the first photograph of the Earth taken from space. And it was taken uh, on a suborbital flight of a V2 rocket uh, that was part of an upper atmosphere research program. And it was launched out of White Sands, New Mexico. Now, if you go over to the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space website, uh, they do a very good job of talking about how we benefit from satellite technology and particularly remote sensing. Uh, however, uh, I come away from their website with a little bit of a different perspective in that they're only considering space from an inward looking and backward looking perspective. Uh, they don't view space as anything other than a platform from which to point instruments 
back at planet Earth. And space is so much more than just that. And over the last 20 years, we've had a real explosion in the uh, remote sensing industry component of the space economy. Uh, as launch costs have gone down and more dramatically, as the electronics costs have gone down and you're able to do more with much smaller, lighter packages, uh, the cost of data acquisition has dramatically declined, leading to a golden age in remote sensing. And this uh, also has downstream consequences in that you have businesses that will buy up uh, data from multiple satellite vendors, uh, and they'll integrate that data, do some value add to it, and then resell that data. And this very now competitive environment has dramatically lowered the cost of uh, acquiring such data that makes this information and this knowledge far more accessible than it has ever been in the past. In fact, back in 2017, uh, the Space Apps Challenge uh, was for teams of students and anybody to use satellite remote sensing data in new ways. And this is driven mainly, you know, by the internet as a global communications platform. So this very idea uh, was something that was completely unimaginable when I was in school. I got my start doing uh, this type of uh, image processing back with the Mars Global Surveyor Mission, which launched in 1996. Uh, and I was very proud that uh, one of the images I processed was selected by NASA for a special uh, congressional gallery uh, exhibit to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the landing of the Viking One lander on Mars. So there were over 5,000 uh, photos submitted, 45 chosen, and I was very uh, excited that one of mine made the cut. So before launching into talking about the satellites, uh, specifically Landsat 8, I'd like to ask each of you to think of your two eyes as being a camera. And your eyes have filters, and each filter is sensitive to a different part of the electromagnetic spectrum, and it has different spectrum coverage. And your brain is the image processing software that takes those separate images and combines them and produces the colorful world that we perceive. This is essentially the same principle by which our mechanical cameras operate. But because they are mechanical and artificial, we can create specialized filters that allow them to see parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that are invisible to us. So we have four filters. Well, Landsat 8's got a full dozen covering a vast array, uh, different parts of the spectrum that we're interested in for specific reasons. So by using different parts of the spectrum and combining pictures that have been taken using different filters together, we can see features that would otherwise perhaps be invisible to us, like for example, uh, the red fire scar that uh, is being shown in this image. Uh, another example is here are three of the, sa they're the same photograph three times. The only difference is that different filters were used in combination to produce each image with each filter being sensitive to a different part of the electromagnetic spectrum 
meaning that each filter is going to highlight something different because everything absorbs and reflects light differently. So this is where I start. I, I start with uh, four frames from uh, a single Landsat scene. Uh, the red, blue, and green are obvious. Uh, what might not be obvious is the one that's labeled brightness, which corresponds to band eight. And as you can see, it has broad spectral coverage. And that's because it's meant to give us a much better view of the relative brightness of different areas in the scene. And as I say, these images are not very exciting. They're very dull, very low contrast. So this is where the image processing work begins. So I'll use a variety of techniques as well as tools to take these four images and combine them together in order to produce a full color image. In this case, it's an image, uh, for me, the attractive part is Musa Bay, which is an estuary right here in the center. Uh, and right here, this is the Persian Gulf. And you've got the Shadigan uh, Wildlife Refuge, uh, this green area here. Uh, and this is uh, Iran, uh, is where this is. And this is one of the largest petrochemical complexes on the planet right here. Now here's the challenge, and this is where things get iffy. For this image, I combined everything. I did colorization, but I did nothing else. Uh, I don't think anyone is gonna be very excited about this image. It's hard to tell what you're looking at too, because there's just no uh, contrast either with respect to color or brightness. So you start processing and, and manipulating the data, pixel pushing. And so this is an image that I think I'm pretty happy with because I think this uh, provides or offers a fairly realistic representation of what this feature actually looks like. But I can push those pixels a little bit harder and create a more intense image. So it's a judgment call about how far you wanna go when you're processing any particular image and what it is you're seeking to accomplish when you're processing that image. So just bear in mind that when you're looking at images of the Earth that have been acquired via satellite, that what you see is not necessarily going to be what you get, whether it's uh, one person or another person or a fully automated process that is colorizing these images. Uh, what you see may not be what you as a person would see if you happen to be sitting at that same vantage point in space. Uh, now, I first wrote about the question of color a number of years ago, because I got bent out of shape when Hoagland and company were claiming that uh, NASA was faking the colors of Mars to make it look like a hostile alien world. They claimed that Mars was actually very much like Arizona. It had a blue sky and it was not nearly as red. And they cited as proof the fact that they could take one of these images of Mars and apply the Photoshop auto levels tool to the image and that that would show the true colors of Mars. Uh, the only problem is they didn't know what they were talking about because they didn't understand what exactly the auto levels tool does to the underlying data that's in the image. So on the right over here, I decided to take a photograph of a sunset in Arizona 
And since I was standing on the spot and took the picture, I can say that the image on the left, the labeled original, is representative of what I actually observed with my own eyes. Uh, I took the image and I ran it through the Photoshop Auto Levels tool. And as you can see, my red sky has become blue because Auto Levels is trying to uh, equalize out uh, the three different color channels. So how did I find the images I'm going to be sharing with you tonight? Well, I use Google Earth a lot. And there's a lot of zooming in and zooming out as I try to find areas of interest and then zooming in to an appropriate level of detail that mimics what you're going to be seeing on the screen tonight and then deciding, okay, is this surface area suitable? Uh, is it interesting enough for me to continue uh, investigating? Uh, once I find something, I note its location, its latitude, and its longitude, and I go over to the USGS Earth Explorer application, uh, put in the coordinates, fill out a couple other parameters in the search tool, and begin searching for the satellite imaging data. Uh, it's a little bit of a pain uh, because you have to go through a number of images to find a good one, whether it's a question of cloud cover or it's a question of season because some areas, uh, the nature of the image is going to vary dramatically depending on season, particularly if it's rainy versus dry, summer versus winter. I find the image, uh, and then I send in my order to uh, receive the image and I will subsequently get a notice that it, I've gotten it and I'll use uh, a, a tool that USGS provides to download my data files. Now something else I like to do is I like to have a clue about the names of things that are in the image I am working with. And I have found the GeoNames tool to be really uh, indispensable. It's a marvelous tool to use if you want to find out the names of things on planet Earth. And so here uh, I'm using Point Hope, Alaska as my guinea pig. On the left, we have GeoNames, and every one of those little bubbles is a different feature name. And on the right, we have Google Earth. So I give Google Earth a F minus, 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 uh, because they just don't have any of the information I need. And this is with every naming option turned on. Uh, and I particularly like that the Point Hope Native Store uh, is out in the Tchaikovsky Sea. So if you want to visit the store, you either have to paddle or swim. So tonight I'd like you to think of the interacting artists that have been at work on Canvas Earth, uh, because they all have a role to play in shaping the surface of the Earth uh, and in creating the visions we're going to be seeing tonight. All the images I use are from Landsat 8 for consistency, and they're all going to be at the 15 meter resolution, which you can see right here. And you can see 15 meter square pixel is a, the interior of a baseball diamond, like from home plate out to the pitcher's mount. So that gives you an idea of what one pixel is going to represent. And I'm also quite sure uh, to maintain all images at the same scale, 29 kilometers wide, 16 kilometers tall, unless otherwise noted in the upper left corner of the screen. Because I want you to be able to look at features from one image to the next and realize that they're at the same scale. Uh, I'd also ask you to observe the relationships between uh, the different features that you may, may see 
in the different uh, images. Uh, one thing that's going to be a challenge is topography. Uh, you don't know if that's a basin that you're looking at or a mountain because we are looking at something from overhead. So it can be a bit of a game uh, in some of the images trying to figure out which way is up. And the gray image here, this is actually the gray image represents a, a full size Landsat scene data frame. The images I'll be showing you tonight are this little white square in the corner. That's that uh, 29 kilometers by 16 kilometers. So once I download a single scene, there's a lot of territory I can hunt around in to find something interesting. So because I am in Chicago and I give this talk mostly in the Chicago area, I start off with a photograph of Chicago because it's something everybody here can relate to. And so they can go down and they can see, oh, there's Buck, here's Buckingham Fountain. I know how big that is. Here's the Adler Planetarium. Here's Navy Pier. Uh, so it provides everyone with a, uh, a point of reference at some place that they've probably stood and can directly relate to. And in the red square here is Midway Airport. And that red square is approximately one square mile. So here we're looking at the city of Chicago. You've got this in mind. And now it's off to Europe, and we see the city of Venice, in the Venice uh, surrounded by the Venice Lagoon. And depending on your screen, you should be able to make out the Grand Canal, which cuts right through the heart of Venice. And yes, there is really a place called Timbuktu. It's in Mali. Uh, it is, to the north on this screen is uh, the Sahara Desert. To the south is the Niger River. And I offer this uh, in part because it's a city of about 55,000 people. And that takes us to a temporary city that's Black Rock City, which is where the Burning Man Festival is held. And this is from 2013. Uh, when the festival peaked out at 69,000 uh, attendees. So I suspect that in this big sea that you see here tilted on its side, there's approximately 69,000 people. And I don't have any UFOs in my show tonight, I'm sorry, but I do have an identified non-flying saucer. Uh, the centerpiece of the Burning Man this year was the recreation of a flying saucer and it was 120 feet in diameter and you can see that right above my little hand here that dark circle uh, in the center so that's 120 feet across so again to give you an idea of the image resolution i uh, love this picture it's uh, a fragment of Manicougan Crater. Uh, it's one of the oldest impact craters, and it's also the largest visible impact crater on the planet. And as you see, there's no notes up here, so you know this is a 15 meter per pixel, 29 by 16 image, but I'd ask you to kind of see if you can memorize what you're seeing on this screen, because on the next screen, I'm gonna show you the full crater uh, in its entirety. And we were up here. So this is the Man uh, Manicougan Crater. You have this annular lake. And the 20% size uh, means that I've crammed five times as many pixels, or excuse me, five times as many meters into a pixel as I was doing. So instead of 15 meters per pixel, it's now at 75 meters. Per pixel. And just for grins, I decided that I wanted to find pictures of Camp Century because uh, I do a talk about Camp Century as an analog lunar base. It's a nuclear powered city that the U.S. Army built underneath the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, 
and in a brilliant bit of what I will call true military intelligence, they realized they couldn't hide the fact that they were doing this, so they came up with a totally fake cover story and advertised that they were doing it in order to hide the true intent of the project, which was Project Ice Worm, which you might want to look up on Wikipedia. Uh, but here's the problem. As I say, it was built underneath the Greenland ice sheet. What color is ice? White. What color are clouds? White. So trying to find a cloud-free image uh, proved to be too much for me, and I finally gave up without ever finding anything that was a cloudless day on the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, and clouds are a particular problem uh, when you're trying to get images of tropical islands that don't have any clouds around them. It's next to impossible. But sometimes you want those clouds uh, because they demonstrate something about the way the Earth works. Uh, this is the Boa Vista. It's a volcanic island off uh, the coast of Africa. And you will note that on the lee side of the island, you see no clouds. And what that tells you is which direction the clouds are coming from, which direction the wind is blowing. It's blowing from the top of the screen to the bottom of the screen. And I'm going to be using the same image right here to show you at a larger scale. Not only do you see the weather front there, with the line of cloud formation, but you also see how the two islands impact the flow of air and consequently the flow of clouds, as well as spur cloud formation on their own. A little bit more tropical, Andros Island. Again, noting this is at 30 meters per pixel. And the Bahamas, uh, you know, Andros Island is built on the skeletons of the dead. Now, in this case, the, the skeletons are basically uh, coral uh, and seashells. Uh, all of that that has been converted into uh, a form of limestone, which is the foundation for these islands. And this is from the other end of the island. Now, Bearing in mind what I had said previously uh, about coloring, pay attention to these couple of islands down this area right down here. So this is from one Landsat 8 scene that I processed one way. Here is that area back at our 15 meters per pixel. A different scene processed a different way, producing a much more potentially natural looking Andros Island. Uh, I'll leave it to you to answer the question of which one of the two is more realistic. And I particularly love the Bahamas because of the, the shallowness of the water. They have an overabundance of shoals uh, because the Bahamas are right at the border between the Atlantic Ocean and the Caribbean. And recall earlier, I had talked about that auto levels uh, tool in Photoshop for altering color. So I took this image after I was, had completed work on it, and I simply ran it through the Photoshop auto levels, which took the image and converted it from this into this. So frankly, I think I prefer this version of the image. And more shoals from the Bahamas. You know, I particularly love uh, the way the flow of water uh, interacts with the sand and creates these submarine features that then get reflected through the water uh, a varying depth. So nature is truly a really creative artist. Further south is the Turks and Caicos Islands. These are British territories. And you see, I try as I might, I could not find a cloud 
free image for these islands. This was the best I could do. But then again, there are instances uh, where you do want to have some clouds and sometimes more is better. This is the Darwin volcano. I particularly like this because of the uh, different intensity of coloration uh, for the uh, volcanic flows that occurred over a period of time. And the clouds you see are what are termed uh, orographic clouds that are created as the air moves up the flanks uh, of the volcano. Uh, these are something that we were surprised to observe uh, back in the old days on Mars when we were getting uh, those first photos back from, uh, I believe it was from the Mariner 4 satellite. So we were surprised to see an atmospheric process there that was so closely related to an atmospheric process that we have right here on Earth. Uh, and this is a shield volcano, I might add. Uh, versus a strato volcano. Uh, this is the Allade volcano, and you can see some smoke coming out of the caldera. And I like the pattern of uh, the dendritic drainage network created by surface rain runoff. Most, volcan most famous volcano of all, Vesuvius, uh, I would say most famous because it's the one that erupted in 79 AD and buried uh, uh, Her Herculaneum, uh, as well as the more well-known city of Pompeii. Uh, this is the first uh, observed volcano for which there is written records, and those written records came from uh, Pliny the Younger. Uh, there may be a saying you're familiar with, uh, by Pliny the Elder, and I think the statement goes like, uh, fortune favors the brave. And that is a statement that he made to one of the sailors on the ships as they were sailing into the port and this volcano is erupting and they were gonna go see who they could save. And some of his sailors were saying, turn back, turn back, uh, to which Pliny the Elder says, no, fortune favors the brave. Needless to say, their ship got back, but Pliny never made it. Uh, he died there. So anyway, if you look down here, you'll see a little yellow uh, circle. This is Pompeii. This is where the excavated ruins of Pompeii are. And the distance from this yellow circuit to the central cone on Vesuvius uh, is 10 kilometers. Okay, so we've got our distance measure here, 10 kilometers. Meanwhile, back in the USA, we have Mount Anachak, and here is its caldera, which is itself 10 kilometers uh, in diameter. And, and this is also a shield volcano. And again, I particularly like, you've got the interplay here, you've got snow, but you have terrain that's emerging from the snow cover. So you have the, this fine linear network that I find quite appealing, as well as the, the degree of contrast that's in the image. Uh, very abstract, uh, a network of rivers and streams in Papua New Guinea on the south coast running into uh, Deception Bay. And zooming out, we can see, and you can see right here that previous image, I've got it highlighted in this rectangular box. You can see that the topography and the nature of the local environments is such that this is not a unique feature, it's a very widespread feature. So one of my favorites. Uh, much more famous is the Sundarbans uh, network, which is actually part of a river delta. And what you're looking at here is actually uh, a, na a national park. And this is a ma all mangrove forest. Zooming out and heading over to the east, on the left here, we have the Sundarbans the Sun National Park with all the mangrove forests. And over here, where all this brown is, uh, is populated agricultural area. And right here, you have part 
of the river delta of the Ganges, the, Ma the Brahmaptra, and the Meghna. And this is the one time I'm going to show a full Landsat image frame. If you think back to that one photo I showed you of the big gray square, uh, this is the full frame because you need the full frame because this river delta is the largest river delta on the planet. And I love the flow, uh, the massive flow of sediments into the Bay of Bengal. Uh, and more settlements. Kind of reminds me of a uh, evening sunset. Uh, more settlements. I very much like this one as well, the Mackenzie River, uh, which is the longest river in Canada and has the uh, second largest draining network in North America, the largest being the Mississippi. And another different take on the Mackenzie River. And speaking of the Mississippi River, this is a couple of lakes uh, that are very close to the Mississippi River. So sediment flows just aren't from rivers into open bodies of water. You also have sediments that are deposited via surface runoff into closed bodies of water. And these bright rectilinear features you see here peeking in at the bottom, that's actually New Orleans. And you also note that this is at 50% size. So instead of being at 15 per pixel, uh, we're actually going at 30. And a Delta River lobe. Uh, this is the St. Bernard lobe. Uh, this is where the Mississippi River emptied into the Gulf uh, from about 1,000 to 3,000 years ago. But as the sediments got deposited and built up, eventually the resistance to the flow of the river's water was such that the river altered course and found a different outlet to the Gulf. Uh, Volga River Delta emptying into the Caspian Sea. This is just a part, a small part of that river delta, which is the largest delta in Europe. And it's not just sediments that you can see in the ocean, but through algae blooms, you can actually see how the currents are flowing and how wind and those currents influence the distribution uh, of these algae. Uh, Niger River, I mentioned that earlier when I was talking about Timbuktu. I call this the inland delta. But it is not a delta, because a delta is where a river empties into a body of water. This is an artifact of the local topography, where everything kind of flattens out. So the river runs into this area at the north. It spreads out all over the place. And then at the south, all of these little individual branching networks come back together and then carry on to the sea. Uh, and this is the actual river delta for the Niger River. And a different area of the Niger River delta. And I also find river meanders particularly fascinating. Uh, these very curvy structures. As I said, nature really does love her curves. And this is, of course, all influenced by the nature of the volume of water that's available, how consistently it's available, how variable it is, and also by the nature of the terrain, how strong or weak the terrain is, how the altitude changes uh, over distance. So that, of course, influences how quickly the water is flowing and how erosive it is. And right over here, 
you've got a little oxbow lake. So you know that this river used to curve around and go this way. But now over time, it's gradually gotten shut off because deposits, sediment deposits got built up in this area right here. And the McKenzie River again with both a heavy sediment load uh, and the braiding of the channels as it approaches uh, the ocean. This is my favorite, the Kobuk River. This is a paraglacial river, which means that it undergoes these repeated cycles of freezing solid and then thawing and then freezing solid. So you have ver a lot of variability in the water flow. And so what you're looking at here is the history of how this river has moved around over time. And this is just a shot of some uh, surface ice on Lake Ilamana. And back at Musa Bay, I really wish they hadn't built the Khomeini petrochemical complex right where they did, because it really ruins the picture. Uh, but again, the distribution of this drainage network is heavily influenced by the nature of the local topography and the nature of the local rainfall. And this is downstream of Musa Bay. Uh, where it's emptying into the Persian Gulf. And actually, in this image, you can make out a small boat right there going uh, down the river. Uh, this is probably my favorite sediment flow image. And this is of the uh, Rio Geba River which flows into the Canal de Geba, which flows into the Atlantic Ocean. And every time I look at this, this is immediately adjacent to that last uh, scene. Uh, I think of coral uh, every time I look at this truncated uh, tributary network. You see how short the arms are. And zooming out, the previous image I showed you, the first image I showed you was right up here. The last image was right over here. And this is the Besejos Islands. It's an archipelago of islands. It was created from the sediments deposited by the Rio Grande and the Rio de Geba River deltas. And of course, what you see is because you've got a lot of variability in the depth to the bottom, as well as where the water is flowing quickly versus slowly, and how the sediment loads uh, varies from one area to the next. Uh, back up in the Arctic, we've got the Yukon River Delta and more sediment flows. So yeah, I do like the artwork that sediment flows create. Uh, another shot of the Yukon River Delta, this time focusing on its network of channels uh, where it empties into the Bering Sea. And back with the Volga River Delta, some more sediment flows with a very different feel to them. And the most pristine uh, river delta is that of the Lena Delta. Uh, and this is a permafrost area. And you see all this ice wedging and pingos uh, that create this beautiful, uh, unique terrain. So if you're interested in more, I just go on a search engine and type in the Lena Delta. Uh, it's a popular target. It's particularly spectacular to see when you look at it in its entirety, because it is a very large delta. Uh, Point Hope again, 
which was used uh, previously to demonstrate naming of features. And for me, it reminds me of some sort of prehistoric beasts, the skeleton of the head of a prehistoric beast whenever I look at it. Um, in Africa, on the left, we have the Atlantic Ocean. And on the right, we have the sand desert of the Namib, which is really a spectacular desert. It has some of the most spectacular dune fields on the planet. As well as the Teshub River, which is an ephemeral river, which means it only lives uh, for a short while after a heavy enough rain. In fact, the sand dunes in this area, uh, the number one water agent acting on the surface is not rain, it's fog, because it is a very dry area. Some of the linear dunes that are found in the park, and linear means simply that the dunes are forming parallel to the direction of the wind. And here you can see how it's not just islands that interfere with the flow of clouds across the surface of the ocean, but you have a, an island mountain here that has interfered with how the wind flows across this surface and how the dunes are formed. And you see they're quite chaotic uh, on this uh, upwind side of uh, the mountain. And back to that whole thorny issue of color again, five different images of the same scene. The PIP here in the lower right-hand corner, that's Plaxco image processing. So that is how I processed the data. And we've got Zoom Earth's view of the same scene, the USGS representation of the same scene, Google Earth, and a photograph taken from ISS. So five different photographs of the same thing, uh, no two alike. Um, the Rubakali Desert Sand Sea, it's the largest sand desert uh, in the world. It, it's what is known as an erg, which is basically a sand ocean. This is also known as the empty quarter because nobody goes there. Okay, this isn't nature, it's artificial. This is an example of a pivot irrigation system. Uh, I happen to find them particularly fascinating and beautiful. Um, I chose this one. I mean, we use this stuff in North America. Uh, it's pretty common. But I chose this one because of the nature of the surrounding land. Look at how uniform the land is. That's because it's in the Sahara Desert. Um, and this is, shows you the full complex, the New Valley Project. Uh, why Egypt decided to build this project out in the middle of the desert, I don't know. Maybe they got a really good price on the land. But what they do is they pipe in the water that for this project from an artificial lake that is 150 miles east of this complex. Uh, this is a famous structure that became known uh, once we had a space program going. Uh, this is a little corner of the Rikat structure. Uh, which is commonly known as the Eye of Africa. So just gonna take on a mini tour of this and then I'll show you a full size image. Some of the complex uh, drainage networks that are a part of the structure. And this is actually the Eye of Africa, the central feature of this structure. And for a really long time, geologists looking at this, once we accepted the idea that rocks fly in from outer space and hit the earth and make big holes and create impact craters, for a long time, it was believed that this had to be an impact crater and it left the geologist 
scratching their heads as to why they couldn't find solid evidence of it being an impact crater. As it turns out, it's not an impact crater, it's a geological dome. And here's a full size image of the whole area. So this was a significant landmark. So if you're flying across Africa uh, in your low Earth orbit, you, oh, there's the eye of Africa. I know exactly where we are. Uh, Northern Africa has got some uh, amazing features. Uh, the Tanzroft Basin is a rather large area, which has earned itself the name the Land of Terror because of how harsh the environment is there. Uh, I like this image, and I, this one, this image itself reminds me of an evil eye. If you think about it, someone you know looking a little bit cross-eyed. Uh, took another version of this. Uh, Push the pixels a little harder, increase the contrast, sharpened it up a little bit more just to get a different feel. So, different area of the same area uh, region, the Tanzeroft Basin. Uh, this is the Dashi Kabir Desert. This is basically thought to be the bottom of a salt-laden ocean, and when the ocean water evaporated, it left the, behind deposits of salt that are up to four miles deep, if you can consider that, four miles deep of salt. Uh, another desert in uh, Iran, the Lut Desert, and these are Kalutes. This is basically salt deposits that have been eroded by wind blasting particles across the surface. And you can tell that the wind has been fairly unidirectional. And for the homesick, here's a shot of the Grand Canyon. And I was hunting around for a picture Recall how big those Landsat image scenes are. And I decided to include this one uh, in my presentation because I really like the texture, the density of the drainage network, the coloration. So it appealed to me. Uh, but I did find what I was looking for this time. And that was the Quinlan Mountains. And specifically, I wanted to find something that showed the Kip Peak National Observatory, which I've had the opportunity to visit a few times. And I highly recommend it. If you're in Tucson, you've got no reason not to go up to Kip Peak. And you can see the complexes right up here. Beautiful drive up, beautiful walking around. And of course, uh, west of Tucson. Tucson is over here uh, to the right of the screen and a little bit up. Uh, Western Sahara, another very intense uh, dendritic drainage network in Morocco. And a different form of a drainage network. These are actually glacial flows in Denali National Park. So this is another case of uh, an image kind of being incidental to my true purpose. My true purpose was to see if I could pick out Mount McKinley in the image, uh, and I was able to, Mount McKinley being the tallest mountain peak in North America, and it has since been renamed to Denali, uh, matching the name Denali National Park. And right here, you can see that very faint red circle that I placed there, that is Mount Denali. Ice flows, now I'm gonna ask everybody, tilt your head to the right as hard as you can and tell me whether or not that's a jellyfish or a Portuguese man of war that you're seeing on your screen in this uh, ice flow. Uh, a very different type of ice flow. And just remember the scale that we're talking about here. Remember that first picture of Chicago. 
how would this ice flow compare to Chicago or Venice for that matter? And now a much more artistic looking delicate ice flow. And we're going to end the program at the end of the world, the South Pole. This is a close-up of the texture uh, of the Drygalski ice tongue. And I show you this just so you can see the detail. But what I really want to show you is the next picture because it might, it's one of my favorites because I cannot look at this image and not think of Moby Dick, the great white whale. Because, so I could literally say this is one whale of a tongue. And I lied, I have one last slide to show you. Uh, if you can't believe uh, a whale made out of ice, how about some snow in the Sahara Desert? Yes, it does happen. Rarely, but it does happen. And this was a uh, very between a four to 12 inch accumulation of snow. So I really have to agree with what uh, the Apollo 8 astronaut Bill Anders had to say that we went to discover the moon, we actually discovered Earth. If you think about it, yeah, we, we've gone to space because we want to learn more about our universe uh, and the moon and the planets and, our, and the sun. But in the process, all that technology we've developed, all the insights we've gotten have taught us a lot more about our home planet and I think has made us uh, that much wiser when considering how uh, what we do has an impact on our planet. And yes, I have been working on a book uh, for a couple of years now. It's behind schedule. I've gotten sidetracked by too many other projects, including another book project. So uh, one day soon, uh, hopefully uh, there will be a book out there, Planet Earth is Art. So I want to thank you and remind you that uh, we need you to support us uh, in building our future in space. Uh, I strongly urge you to check out the Chicago Society for Space Studies website at chicagospace.org. You can sign up for our, new, our quarterly newsletter, which is free. It's called Space Watch. It's been around for quite a while. Uh, I also uh, point out that we are a chapter of the National Space Society. And I would ask you to consider investigating that organization. If you want to show your support for space, please go to space.nss.org. Have a look around and consider either becoming a member or making a donation. And that concludes my presentation this evening. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. That was a good talk. And um, if uh, there's a chat box and a Q&A box, uh, if anyone inside the uh, attendees want to, uh, if they have any questions, and Jim, if you go to your bottom for your screen, you see a, a chat box and a Q&A. Well, well, because I'm screen sharing, it's going to be at the top of my screen. So let okay. me see. I, I, I'm going to maintain my screen sharing in case someone would like me to go back uh, to an image. All right. There's um, on see. my screen, I can see the uh, chat box. And there's a couple of questions that people, a uh, couple of questions and comments if you want to kind of go through them. Sure. Let me uh, move over here to where I can read. Oh my goodness, Jim Kovac. Uh, I, I have to give a shout out to Mr. Kovac, who is actually uh, the most active speaker that the Chicago Society for Space Studies has. He does wonderful uh, astronomical presentations. 
So we do uh, maintain a very active Speakers Bureau, giving lots of talks every year in our community uh, that are very uh, education oriented. Um, by, hi, Bob Kaplow, who's also one of our CSSS members, a very uh, active amateur uh, rocketry guy. Uh, all of the spectacular Hubble images we've seen are hand photoshopped. Yes, they are, and uh, they do. There is a fair amount of work done to them to bring out the details, enhance the colors, and this is particularly true when you're working with imaging data that is outside of the range of human perception. So uh, if you think of like an ultraviolet, uh, an x-ray image, you, you're thinking about different parts of the spectrum and someone can go ahead and combine all the, that data into a single image, but how do they color it? Well, they are going to use red, green, and blue. So what they'll do is they'll pick some section of the spectrum and they'll call it red. And typically, uh, they follow the rule that if it's a longer wavelength than what appears in the visual spectrum is red, they'll color it red. If it's a shorter wavelength than what appears in the visual spectrum, they'll color that one blue so that there's a logic uh, to the process. Uh, many of the sediment images uh, that lack any landforms in the image, yeah, that's cropping on my part, uh, in part, because I had to fit the image within this uh, 29 by 16 kilometer boundary box so I could have everything full size uh, at the same ratio and screen size. And so it suited my tastes to crop out uh, anything that I considered to be extraneous, uh, which would involve, you know, uh, in some instances having to rotate the image from its native camera angle as taken by the Landsat 8, so. How much does it cost to have, act oh, this is the great thing now. Uh, Jack has asked, how much does it cost to have access to these images from different sites? Now, if you're talking about getting to the, the Landsat 8 images, you can set up a free account on the USGS Earth Explorer application. That it gets you access to a pretty broad array of images. If you want to do Sentinel-2, which a lot of people do, uh, that's separate. And as you may recall, let's see how quickly I can scroll through these. Somewhere way back at the beginning of my talk, I had a side-by-side -side comparison because I've done some Sentinel-2 processing. Uh, you can see how a Landsat 8 scene frame compares to a Sentinel-2 frame. And they're also, they have, uh, their spectrum coverage is pretty well the same in terms of the visual spectrum, um, but I just prefer the quality of the Landsat 8 over Sentinel-2, so that's my own personal bias. Uh, but it's free. The cost of accessing the data is free, and you will note that somewhere I'm going, am I going the wrong way? Let's see, I am going the wrong way. Uh, two of the tools that I, well, actually three of the four tools I mentioned here are free, GMIC, raw therapy, and Python. Uh, Python being a programming language, raw therapy being an image processing application. 
And GMIC being a command line image processing language. However, the nice thing about GMIC is if you know how to use GIMP, there is actually a GMIC plugin. So you, if you're a GIMP user, you can get the free GMIC plugin for GIMP and do everything inside of GIMP that you would want to do. So uh, recall that I had said previously about automated processes. Some parts of my process I automate, and that's where I use Python to create scripts and kick off batch GMIC programs so I can do a bunch of things I don't want to do repetitively. And if you're in the USGS Earth Explorer, you can see some examples of what happens when you use an automated process that is looking at image data in a certain way. So you have things like blue clouds, uh, because again, they're using a, a standard approach, not taking into account the you know variabilities of any given image. And you can come up with some pretty interesting looking photos that have been processed by the computer. So I would encourage, uh, have you heard of anyone using software such as Blender or Urban Engine to render virtual images? Um, something that I have, uh, uh, he meant to say the Unreal Engine. Something I've considered doing and I haven't done yet is some people have gone to taking, you can take the Landsat data and some take the quick way out and use data from Google Earth. And you can drape it over uh, DIM, digital elevation model data. So for this audience, uh, you're probably familiar with uh, MOLA, Mars Orbiter Laser Altimeter. So you create your vertical landscape using the MOLA data. Uh, and then you use your color data, you take it from you know, Mars Observer, Mars Global Surveyor, Viking, whatever, and then you drape the colors over the elevation data so that you can create a three-dimensional view of the surface, and then you can change your camera angle to a, an oblique, and you get those really cool pictures of Olympus Mons on Mars. So people have been doing that uh, with Landsat data uh, and digital elevation data. And I believe that some have done it using GIMP, but I would not swear to that. But it is something worth investigating, I would say. Uh, I've heard some archeological sites were made by satellite imaging. Uh, there have been some I have not seen firsthand, but there my understanding is that there have been some archaeological discoveries made using satellite data. Some of them, I think, might have been done using the synthetic aperture radar uh, that was flown on uh, some of the space shuttle missions. It might have been one only or more than one. Uh, again, looking at minute variations in elevation changes and as I said, nature loves curves, uh, but if you see straight lines, you know, you can roll the dice and bet that they're human artifacts. So I believe that it, these discoveries, particularly in the jungles, uh, were made using uh, the synthetic aperture radar. Uh, I haven't really looked into that, so would feel uncomfortable, you know, saying anything too definite. So, and I think, I, I think I'm all caught up on the questions that were in the chat. But if anyone is, uh, Okay, I have to highlight this. David says, check out the work by Sarah Parkick at UAB. At uh, University of Alabama. Uh, uh, she's a professor there inside Birmingham. Uh, it's not too far from Huntsville. And actually, uh, 
try to get her to speak to HAL 5 before, but I, I can never reach contact with her. But she actually is a, uh, has done what Tim talks about. He's used NASA satellite data to look for pyramids and to look for lost cities inside the inside jungles. And, she, and she's been featured on a number of like TEDx talks and stuff like that. So she's really taken a lot of, uh, taken a lot of NASA satellite data and really, and it has really, uh, and um, he's been a feature on some uh, Discovery Channel uh, TV shows where she took NASA data to, to find, for example, lost pyramids and actually use that data to track it down and actually has gone there. So there is some uh, research. So back into uh, Tim Weaver's question about using satellite uh, data to find, figure out, to look, to locate, to locate archaeological sites that do, uh, Sarah Parkek, that's the one person I have seen who's done exactly that kind of work. And I think she's got some books published and a number of research papers. And if you go on, if you look at her name on YouTube, you can find a lot of her uh, TEDx talks. So she's done a lot of work, work, work like that pretty, pretty recently too. Yeah, so here, here's an example just of using Google Earth to zoom in. And here's that one shoal that I like so much right here. So, but now something else, you know, uh, Google Earth isn't just about Earth. You can get the data files and you can use Google Earth to search Mars. And what you're seeing here is I've selected uh, a number of the Mars Observer uh, image files to say I want to show uh, that where you know there is coverage of Mars and so you can zoom in and here we got so some beautiful bark and dunes right off the bat so you can then go and now the thing is uh, the problem with high-rise imagery is because they're using uh, some intense colorization uh, and it's going to be of a very narrow strip and this is why they have things like blue sand dunes they're really not blue but what it is is they have stretched and pushed the pixels so much to make the image look good that uh, the color you see is cannot be considered as representative of the actual colors of Mars. And it's because it's, they are dark sands and they're trying to pull up detail. And that means just, you know, uh, being a little more aggressive with how much manipulation of the data you are doing. So, well, here, let's stick here. Let's try, okay, this one's interesting. So let's go take a look at this and see. Not bad. And th this state is actually kind of easy to work with. Uh, if you want to see the full image, I'm not sure what this is going to do to my bandwidth. But uh, you have a nice family of dunes here. And you can see just in black and white, just how dark they are. So if you take a layer of color and simply drape it over this image, uh, white is still gonna be white and black is still gonna be black. So, and what they're, the challenge of the folks processing the data is to, okay, somehow make it more colorful than it is in the data that was acquired by the satellite's camera. So, but from this web page, you can download uh, the image data uh, if you're using something like GIMP or one of the other uh, programs that's out there. You can make your own uh, color pictures of Mars. It's a little bit more challenging. Uh, when I used to do Mars Global Surveyor, there was a red and a blue. 
So I had to fake a green and I would do that by doing a merger of the red and the blue and manipulate them a little bit uh, just to throw it off a little to give some more color value to the actual image. Uh, because for the MRO's uh, context camera is simply a single black and white image. Uh, it does take uh, more work uh, to come up with color. And basically what you're doing is you're simply inventing the color for that image and you're trying to make it look like something plausible. So what I do uh, is I will get the full frame black and white image and let me see if I can get out of here now that I now that I'm here. No, he's not okay. Let me go open it in Google Chrome. So you can actually see the full frame much nicer here. But because I can't back up, I have to go back to Google Earth and then try and find that image again. I'm going to right click, copy the link, go back to my browser. So what I, the technique that I will use is to go into the merged RGB and pull it up. And you see, you only get a little bit of color in the image. And again, you see that there's really no color here. Uh, I'll, attempt to use this as something of a guide. And if I'm not happy with the high rise color, uh, I'll just go uh, with the RGB color and see what it looks like. And again, you can see it's really heavy on the blue side. But I try to use the color strip that high rise gives me uh, when it comes to deciding how to colorize the context uh, camera's version of the same scene. Hey, all right, Jim. We have a uh, someone that would like to have a, that is would like to to have a question. Joan Raylick. Oh my goodness! Okay, hi, Joan. Okay, let me allow her to talk. Uh, Joan, can you hear us? Can you talk? I think she's allowed to talk now. She's on mute, but she can she's talk no longer now. on mute. Sure, Hi, Joan. Hi, Joan. Good. Good talk. I wish I could have heard the talk, but unfortunately, we I got the last thing where you said this. Now, well, that's my presentation. Oh. <laughs> we'll be posting this on YouTube later tonight. Yay. Uh, I'll be posting on YouTube, so if you want, I'll send you the uh, link. If you want to send me your contact information, I'll actually so show you our, uh, our the Hal Five YouTube channel. I'm going to put my email in here. If anyone wants the link, I'll be post. I'll try to. I should be able to post this okay. later tonight. Uh, Dean Newsom underscore delft at yahoo.com. So I'll be uh, we'll be posting our talks on our YouTube channel. So in case you miss it, Great. you can find it there. Great, I, lo I love the pictures. Everything, uh, everything looks great. At least the little bit I was able to see. So, uh, well, I had been looking forward to hearing the whole thing. So I'm glad you're posting it. Me too. I'll be curious to hear what I had to say. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, there was someone who had a question earlier. I think in the uh, Q and A. Uh, uh, is this the? Do you have a philosophy to guide what images you render? Yeah, that was my question. Yeah, like if you can like just randomly choose them, like just by you look at the draw, you, you stumble across them and say, hey, that's a cool image. Let me look at it. Or kind of like, do you have a, like some kind of guidelines? Like, let me look for some kind of picture that has some features to it. Ah, well, for, for the Earth, and the same applies to Mars, uh, there are certain regions that, you know should have something river deltas anywhere where you have a river meeting the ocean you know you're gonna you can expect to see some sediment flows uh so that's a prime target and then you get the intricate uh patterns uh of the delta itself so that's a target 
uh, dunes, all you need to do is, okay, what are the interesting deserts of the world? And let me go back to Google, or just like we did here. Now, this was pure chance that I, well, not pure chance, because I, uh, these bark and dunes uh, tend to uh, accumulate in the bottoms of craters. So when I'm looking at things on Mars, I am looking in crater bottoms or along vertical relief areas, whether it's a crater wall or a valley wall. Or I'm looking at something circumpolar, particularly if I'm looking for an example of those spider-like spots you get as the surface starts defrosting, coming out of winter, going into spring. So uh, you've got the twin thing about the seasons as well as where you are on the planet. So going back to the Earth, so what type of feature would you like to see if you're looking for deserts? Well, we can head right over here. And so I see as we as I zoom in, I'm still fairly well zoomed out, I can see different patterns of dunes. And as I see things that catch my eye, I can decide to zoom in to a point, uh, I have a little guide, I don't have it with me, that tells me what will kind of approximate something that if I was to zoom in a little bit more, that's where I would be in terms of the 15 meters per pixel resolution. And so it's really a lot of time spent zooming in and out of areas that at a zoomed out level, look like they're potentially interesting. Okay, right here, I'm fairly well zoomed out, but this is something interesting because I see a discoloration here off the coast. So I can zoom in here. And okay, we've got some subsurface sand deposits. Okay, that could be interesting as I zoom in. This could be interesting. So then it's a question of noting the latitude and longitude of the feature. Then going over to the USGS Earth Explorer, logging into my account, plugging in the latitude, longitude, picking the data sets, picking cloud coverage and any other parameters, and then just going through and keeping my fingers crossed that I find something that I can use. So um, random doesn't have much to do with it. So I see Bob here has posted something. Let me copy that out of the, is he not gonna let me copy the link? Let's see, okay, he'll let me go there. The Q Project Sunroof. Solar Savings Estimator. Wait, is it Bob, why, why are you posting? Uh, Something about, okay, that's a little interesting there. Solar potential. It uses the Google Earth images. Ah, okay. Yeah, there's also, there's another tool. Uh, I want to say its name is earth.zoom. I think it might be, uh, owned by Microsoft, but here's my problem with this tool. Here I am zoomed out. I don't see anything but clouds. So I'm going to zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and zoom in, and I still can't make out anything at all. You have to zoom all the way right down uh, to a feature. So this is not at all suitable for searching. You know, so I don't use it for that. I have on occasion looked at it to see if I could find a feature name that wasn't in Google Earth, but nothing beats geonames. 
And there is one more question uh, from Sarah Farhara, if I said this incorrectly. Uh, well, uh, there are, these are fantastic pictures. Can we get a copy of your presentation? Would that be available or? Uh, no, uh, you can use the copy that's been captured uh, here tonight uh, and which will be posted, I guess, to YouTube. Mm -hmm. Is that okay to post it to YouTube, by the way? Oh, yeah. Okay, I, was, I just wanna make sure, okay, yeah. Okay, so that, that answers that question. Yeah, by the time I, YouTube yeah. gets done stepping on stuff. <laughs> with their compression yeah well yeah so i guess a lot of these pictures are going into your book uh some of them are uh the book has a lot more photos uh than this and some of these i decided to go for the book others i was using as i was trying to get a mix of surface features and mm -hmm. cover you know the highlights you know, showing dendritic networks, uh, the volcanoes, uh, so, and mixing things up a little bit. Uh, so some will make it into the book. That's good enough. Okay. Yeah, because I'll probably be uh, posting this on our YouTube channel later tonight, actually. Um, because I already had to face the YouTube going, so it's, it wouldn't be too hard to render this on YouTube tonight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, it's now, however, it is now, uh, let's see here, it is now 8.35, so I will be, uh, I guess it's now will be a good time to end tonight's uh, talk for this month, and so with that, Gemma, I would like to thank you again uh, for your great talk here and very neat slides and very neat pictures, shows a lot of neat work. Well, th thank you for having me. Uh, more than happy and more happy to have you back in the future. Uh, let me ask Robin if, he has any, any, if Robin has a, if Robin Scott has any final comments or. Uh, where are you? What? Well, yes. Hold on just a second. I got to turn myself on. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, I just wanted to say, uh, I think y'all did a great job. Jim, you just gave an awesome presentation and i'm into imaging and it was just truly you know even it's in the title a work of art so just thank you so much you know we were very fortunate to have you come and talk to the hal five society and i'm glad that you know it was a joint event to include the uh, chicago uh, uh space uh, Society for Space Studies. It, it was just awesome. Just thank you so much. Well, thank you. And I hope that everyone will think of the Earth, you know, a little bit differently. It really is a beautiful planet. It is, indeed. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and then uh, I guess we can end tonight's talk. Thank you again for attending. And we'll be uh, having our next talk inside August. Um, let me just go in and share it real fast if I can. I'm going to go in and end your talk here. I'm going to share our talk here. Uh, let me just share my slide deck here. Just as a quick reminder, I brought this up earlier. We'll be having a uh, talk in, a talk in, with Greg Allison on upon space habitats next month, August 13th, and a joint panel discussion with the STA and Dr. Ryan ever on the right stuff and uh that will be at september 15th at 6 p.m to ct for those if you for those inside half five in half five in half five and chicago of course if, if if you would like to join those talks more than welcome to join and with that i'm gonna uh go ahead and end tonight's talk and thank you for uh, and to thank the uh the attendees for for to thank the attendees for uh joining joining tonight Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank David. You. Thank you. Thank you, Jim.